I finished Bible college, finished Bible college 22 years ago and I didn't think it would be 22 years of what I've been through. You know, I expected God to use me <laughs> and become a, you know, anyway, I expected God to do more than I have seen as yet. So at times I've suffered from disappointment and um, and I know that many of you have. You know, many of you might be disappointed from um, from relationships that you perhaps have or po- relationships that have failed or something that you're believing God for that hasn't actually happened yet um, and you can and you can be disappointed. Um, I went to America. The Lord told us to go to America and we went to America with the four children and uh, and it was and it was a big deal for us, you know, with four children. We went to America for a year. And I was expecting that that was what the Lord was going to open massive doors and it was all going to be, you know, moving on. <coughs> and uh, I came back from America very disappointed. Part of the reason now when I look back, I, l- I look back at, at what the Lord did in us while I was in America and I wouldn't, now I wouldn't change it for anything. The Lord did in me and and our relationship, my wife and, and our family, he did in, in us much more than, than I expected. The problem is, you see, I was expecting this and I got this. And this was much better, right? Because God's ways are always better. We just don't understand that. Sometimes we think, we have, have this thought that we need to have this. And God says, no, actually you need to really have this and when you get this you'll be better for it and so we can we can go through all this time of being disappointed because we're looking for this <laughs> but god gives us something else and it's always better because god is good god is always good so let me read a few scriptures out to you Turn with me to James chapter 1, James chapter 1 verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. How many have read that scripture over the years and gone, how is it joyful to have trials and persecution? And how many people have said that? We've, I've read that, thing, that scripture and gone, I just don't get that. But it's in there and that's the truth. Turn again to um, Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, verse 3 to 5 says, And not only that, But we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because there's love of God and poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who who was given to us. When I came back from America, I was disappointed because I didn't get what I thought, God gave me something else. It took me years to realise that that's what I needed. But during those years of disappointment, I spent years of disappointment, I, I spent my time, I bought, I, I worked hard and I built houses and did subdivisions and made lots of money and, and had boats and, and I had sports cars. In fact, I had... If, if I could pick, and I'm a car guy, right? If I could pick any car, I ended up with that car. And, and it was even the right colour. Like, even in my disappointment, God blessed me. But during that time, I learned just how pointless those things were. <laughs> it took me a while. Maybe I'm a bit thick, I don't know. But it took me a while. But, but I learned just how... 
how unsatisfying they really are. And I, I didn't have lousy toys, I had pretty nice toys. <laughs> but, but I realised just how unsatisfying the things of this world are. I learnt that lesson. And I learnt that now I learn, and, I st- and sometimes I still get disappointed, but now I look when I get disappointed and, and I just know that, that God is doing a work and that, and that I'm going to grow from that. And that and and my 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 eyes are not on uh, those things anymore. My eyes are on the Lord, and I know that He's the one who transforms. You see, <coughs> disappointments and delays are God's appointments. Just like Pastor Martin said earlier, when you're in the valley, they're like God's appointments. That's where He refines our character. When we have those struggles, that's when he refines our character. He doesn't refine your character when you're driving along the road in a fancy sports car. (laughs) He doesn't define it at all. (laughs) I know that from experience. He refines our character when we have struggles, when we have difficulties, when we have suffering. Because God works all things together for good. Those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Amen. See, we can spend our time, we can get mad at God. We can justify our position and say, God, why didn't you give me this? I, I've been a good person. I, I deserve to have, get this. Why did you give? And then we can compare ourselves to somebody else and say, well, why did you give that person an opportunity? I can preach better than that person. Why did you give them the opportunity and not me? And you can build up a case against God without even realising it. We can build a case against the unfairness of, of life. We can blame God for the unfairness of life. We, we, may, we may expect to have something and we get disappointed by it. We may marry somebody that disappoints us. Not knowing that your spouse might be thinking the same thing. That's hard, isn't it? <laughs> That's a bit hard. But, but, but it's the truth, right? See, so, so we, we, can, we can blame God for things and we can build up a case against God. How many of you know that that's just, that's just not smart? <laughs> it's not smart to do that. Let me give you a word of advice. Don't build up a case against God. You're going to lose. You're going to lose. We need to see the problem is we don't understand God's process. That's the problem. We think we understand what God's doing, but we don't understand the process that God is, what He's trying to do, what He's trying to achieve. See, when we want to blame God for something, we must understand that God is perfectly right and perfectly just. It says in Psalm 89, righteousness and justice are the foundation of His throne, right? Now, if God's throne, this is God's throne, and he's, 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 uh, he's not perfectly just or perfectly right, the foundation, and ask any builder, if your foundation's not right, the house is going to fall down. If he doesn't do what, what is right or just, his foundation falls down. The, the, God's throne will fall down. So we have to understand that God is perfectly right and perfectly just. He will do the right thing. He will not do the wrong thing by you. He will not do the wrong thing by you because that's what happens. And he won't do that. So we can, we can be assured that he will do the right thing by you. Amen? We can blame uh, the church, we can blame the leadership of the church and say, well, that was a silly decision. Why did they do that? Why did they do that? But you see, you don't, you're not sitting in that seat. You're not sitting in that seat. You don't get to make that decision. And you don't get to hear what all of the details of what the leadership have to make decisions on. So it can be... A decision that's made 
that you don't understand the, the ramifications of or the reasons for. But we can blame other people. We can blame them and say, why did they let him do that and they didn't let me do that? Or you might have even been promised something and then, then somehow not received it or not been given it. And you can say that's unfair and you can build up a case against, for example, the leadership of the church or your spouse. No matter how we, we may not agree with things that happen in our lives, we have to understand that, that God has placed those people in positions for a reason. Like your husband or your wife, if you're going back to that disappointment. God has given you that husband or the wife. And you may be disappointed in them and they may be disappointed in you, but God has nonetheless given you that partner. And it's your responsibility to make it work. It's not your responsibility to blame them. Because that doesn't go, that doesn't help. You see, when we have disappointment, we can we can carry this disappointment. And and I heard somebody say once. Disappointment is like it's like having two dogs. One's a friendly dog and one's an angry dog. If you keep feeding the angry dog, the angry dog will keep coming back. But if you stop feeding the angry dog, eventually the angry dog will die. And all you'll have left is the friendly dog. Are you feeding your angry dog? Are you feeding the disappointment in your life? You're feeding the thing that you should be letting go of? Are you saying, why are you doing this to me, God? And carrying the disappointment? Or are you killing it? Or are you not feeding it? It's pretty silent in here. If we feed the disappointment, we never leave it behind. We end up living in it. We end up living in the disappointment. God doesn't want that. God doesn't want us to live in the disappointment. God doesn't want you to live a disappointment. God wants to bless you. But see, we don't understand. We we don't understand God's priority. God's priority, I've learnt this. (coughs) God's priority for me is not to use me. It's not. God's priority for me is to mature me. And in that maturity process, he will then use me. No difference. We're all in the same boat. God's priority for you is not to use you. Even for Pastor Martin, the priority for God is not for for God to use him. God's priority is to make him like Jesus. So he's walking like Jesus. So whenever he gets up on the stage in India, for instance, in three weeks' time, that Pastor Martin is not getting up on the stage preaching in front of 20,000 people. Jesus is getting up on the stage and preaching in front of 20,000 people. So the priority in your life that God has is to mature you, to make you like Jesus, so that we've got 200 Jesuses here. Not one or two or three, 200 of you. We, we misunderstand the process. That's why we get disappointed. We misunderstand what God is trying to do. God didn't bring you here, didn't make you a Christian so that you could be blessed. He didn't. You'll be blessed. <laughs> Don't misunderstand me. I believe God's blessing. But that's not the reason. The reason is to mature you, to make you like Jesus. And we must never forget that. We must never forget that. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul, I want to just look at the Apostle Paul a little bit. And, um, you know, he was one of the great influences of life, of the world. He was one of the greatest influences of the world. Think about that. He was a little bald guy who had bad eyesight and it wasn't a good preacher. 
if we if we really look at what it, what was on about Paul, and yet he became one of the greatest influences the world has ever seen has ever seen. He's had a huge impact on the world, writings, and in virtually every book he talks about suffering and pain and persecution. In the beginning of Philippians he says. He who have begun a good work in you will carry it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay, turn to chapter 3. Uh, verse 1 says this, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. He says rejoice. Verse 3, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. So if you think you're righteous, Paul was more righteous. If you think you're blameless, Paul was more blameless. As far as the law goes, he was perfect. Outwardly, there was nothing about him that was wrong. You think you're zealous? Paul was more zealous. Verse 7, But what things we were gained to me, for these I have counted loss of Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. He got to the point where he saw all of his works, all of his outward holiness to be pointless. Yet indeed I count all things lost for the sake and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Verse 9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Now verse 10, if you want to see the power of his resurrection, you've got to see the fellowship of his sufferings. That's a hard thing to to want to embrace, but if you want to see the power of God work in your life, you need to understand the fellowship of his sufferings. And being conformed to his death. Verse 11. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained. Or I am already perfected. But I press on. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Everything he considers rubbish. That he may just get to that righteousness through Christ. That he may be perfected and that he may press on that he may press on to all that he has, that all that God has for him. Amen? Verse 13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended or to lay hold of it, if you like. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many who are mature, have this in mind. Are you mature? Are you a mature Christian? You consider yourself a mature Christian? We need to take this seriously. 
And if anything of you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the, the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. Paul's saying, I am your pattern. Paul's saying, I am your pattern. And he went through shipwrecks, and he got beaten, and he got persecuted, and he got scorned at. Now, I'm not suggesting you have to do those things, not on purpose anyway. <laughs> but if they happen, we need to learn to live beyond those circumstances. See, this is Paul's, Paul's secret. He learned to live beyond the circumstances around him. That's what he learned, how to, how to live outside of his circumstances. So if, so if someone, was, someone was beating him up, he would say, I rejoice in you, Jesus. When he's thrown in jail, he sings psalms to Jesus rather than going, Oh, why have you put me in here, God? Why? What, you, I, I thought you were going to use me to change the world and now I'm rotting in this prison. No, he puts his hands in the air and he says, he rejoices. He rejoices because he knows that God is good and that God will come through. So if you're going through something, know that God is good and God will come through. Seems so obvious, doesn't it? But we need to remind ourselves of that. That God is good and God will come through. He will come through. Now, Paul, turn with me to chapter 4. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. So these are the secrets of Paul, right? He just talked about his, where his confidence is and how he's not attained to it yet and he's pressing toward the goal and these are the things he does. Verse 4, in the Lord always. Is that rejoice in the Lord when things are going well? Rejoice in the Lord always. When you're having an argument with your wife, rejoice in the Lord always. When you get sacked from your job, rejoice in the Lord always. When your house burns down, rejoice in the Lord always. Verse 6, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God will, will give to you. But be anxious for or nothing you see our responses to the difficulty reveal our true faith our true level of faith how we respond actually reveals where our faith is and that's the reason god does it testing about faith develops perseverance God tests our faith and he does that to mature us. But see, think about Abraham. Abraham waited 25 years for the promise. He was already 75. God gives him a promise. He waits 25 years for God to give the promise to him. 25 years of delay, 25 years of disappointment, 25 years of trying to fulfill that himself. We have an Ishmael. 25 years he went through that. He gets the promise. 10 or 15 years later, he offers that very promise on the altar back to God. The very promise, Isaac. He offers Isaac up. The very promise that he'd waited 25 years ago, he offers it back to God. Why? Because he learned that his circumstances, that, he's, that he's, the promise wasn't tied up 
in the person of Isaac. The promise was tied up in God. And he knew he had enough faith, he recognised that God would work out the situation. He didn't understand why. He didn't understand why, but he understood that God is good, God is faithful and God will come through. 